Yes. Next, we're going to touch on um, this history as it relates to the United Kingdom. Yeah, this history as it relates to the United Kingdom. And then we're going to get into how Black History Month starts in the UK. So pictured here, you see a man by the name of Obi Egbuna from Nigeria. Yeah, another name that we don't know enough about. He is actually the father, yes, the father of black power in the UK. Yeah, um, he travels here from Nigeria, gets involved in the movement and is a key proponent of black power. He's an author, a playwright, political theorist. If you don't know, get to know and shout out to um, his children. Yeah, who are still on the road uh, right now, kings and queens. OK, um, and then you have Mama Claudia Jones. Yeah, the mother of Notting Hill Carnival, but she's not just the mother of Notting Hill Carnival. She travels here. She's from Trinidad. She lives in America for a while. She's, she travels to the UK. And during that time is when Africans from the Caribbean are traveling to the UK in significant numbers. In response to the killing of a brother by the name of Kelso Cochrane, yeah, by racist white youths, yeah. Um, and also the Notting Hill race riot, so-called, yeah, they call it race riots. Well, really what it was, was a group, a gang or gangs of white men running through Notting Hill, which had a significant black population at that time, yeah, um, committing acts of violence against black men, women and children. And so what happened is the black men and women began to defend themselves, yes, um, and uh, were arrested for possession of an offensive weapon, whilst the white boys were arrested for grievous bodily harm and these kinds of, of things. And so she puts on, organizes a community and puts on the first carnival, yes, in the UK in 1959, yeah, in King's Cross, okay? The theme for the carnival is a people's art is the genesis of their freedom and the proceeds go towards paying the legal fees of those brothers who have been arrested for defending uh, their community. OK, so we see that in the 1950s and 60s in this country, things was already going on in relation to activism. And finally, as an example, this is not an exhaustive list, but you have Audley Evans, Paul Stevenson and Owen Henry, who are pictured there as the leaders of the Bristol bus boycott, as inspired by the Montgomery bus boycott in the 1950s. In the 1960, 1963 to be specific, these brothers led the Bristol bus boycott to, um, to campaign against what was called the color bar. Black men who have been brought from our countries, yeah? or shall I say the colonized countries in the Caribbean, all right? To work buses and trains and so on and so forth for... British men who were recovering after World War II could no longer find employment on these buses. And so in order to earn a living wage, support their families, these men campaigned against what is called the colour bar, whereby white men were blocking them from receiving gainful employment. Um, and they launched the Bristol bus boycott. Yeah. Get to know uh, about that history. All right. So off the back of that, how does Black History Month begin in the UK? So to begin talking about how Black History Month began in the UK, we have to call the name, another name that is seldom referenced during celebrations of Black History Month in the UK. And that is a man by the name of Achiaba Adaye Sebo. Yes, he is the founder of Black History Month in the UK. Yeah, every year Black History Month is celebrated and his name is really mentioned. It is a travesty. But that is why we do presentations such as these to ensure that you all get to know these names and get this good information. He is born and raised in Nkrumah's Ghana and he comes to London after living in the USA for a while in 1984. Okay, so setting the context. Yeah, we're going to come back to Baba Achiaba Adaye Sebo in a second. But let's set the context. The context for all of this is what my father refers to as the turbulent 80s. What is the turbulent 80s? This is an era in which there is a significant upsurge in black resistance to oppression in the UK. And it manifests in a few key events, namely the New Cross Massacre. The New Cross Massacre is an event that took place in January, the 18th of January, 1981. What happened? Uh, a house, yes, a house 
that was the scene of a party, yes, of black, a 16th birthday party, yes, black family things, house party back in the day in 1981, was firebombed, yeah, in the borough of New Cross in South London, okay? The firebomb attack killed 12 young African men and women immediately. A third, sorry, a 13th died a year later as a result of burns, yeah, and psychological damage uh, associated with this firebomb attack. Because of the history of such firebomb attacks in that era, Lewisham, South London, New Cross, them kind of things there, Deptford, it, it was the belief of the black community that this was a racist firebomb attack. The police and the media conspired to criminalize the young people who were in the party, yes, as opposed to find the person who firebombed the party. And so what happened is that because of this and other injustices that were being faced in British society, the black people of the country organized the Black People's Day of Action, which was a march from the scene of the um, New Cross Massacre to Parliament. 25,000 black men, women and children joined the Black People's Day of Action. You hear stories of children that were in school when the march passed their school and then dust out of school for the day, jump over the fence and join the Black People's Day of Action, which is to this day the largest yeah, mass demonstration of Black people uh, in this country. The Black People's Day of Action takes place on the 2nd of March, 1981. In April of 1981, the first uprising of the 1980s takes place. Actually, I'm wrong. There was an uprising in Bristol in 1980, yes? But this particular uprising in Brixton, 1981, was sparked because of, in response to what is called sus laws, whereby black men, and women, but black men in particular, could be picked up off the streets and brutalized by the police under the suspicion of the intent to commit a criminal offense, okay? And so it was, it was, un, it was not uncommon for police vans to roam around areas of Brixton, picking up black men, pushing them into, into bully vans, and just basically beating them up and throwing them out back on the streets, yeah? Um, black deaths in custody was already an issue by this time, um, and other injustices in the society as it relates to employment and all of these things, yeah? So, one day in Brixton, yeah, in April 1981, the police were particularly heavy-handed with the brothers and the brothers decided to fight back. What resulted in what is what is called the Brixton Uprisings, what they call Brixton Riots. And that Brixton Uprising sparks uprisings all over the country, in Bristol, Liverpool, Toxteth, uh, Luton, yeah? Everywhere that there's a significant black population and even some Asian populations around the country got in on the act, yeah? So uprisings are all over the place. Yeah, in 1981, okay? So that's nationwide uprisings. Then now, in 1985, you have the shooting of uh, Cherry Gross, yes, in Brixton, which sparks another uprising. And then you also have the, uh, the death in custody of Mama Cynthia Jarrett in Tottenham, which sparks... Another uprising in 1985 called the Broadwater Farm Uprising, okay? So, Broadwater Farm is particularly important um, because of the fact that this was also the era in which drugs and guns become a reality in the black community uh, in the UK. Not going to go into it deeply, except to say that the police had Broadwater Farm Estate locked down for months 
whereby people like my parents had to be smuggling in food and water onto the estate. But things like crack cocaine and heroin were becoming readily available on the estate, whilst at the same time, there was a drought in Ganja. Yeah? But this was an uprising. So all, but, and in this era, the untold story of this era is not just riots and uprisings, but the extent to which black communities began to organize. Yeah? So... The Pan-African Congress movement begins in the 1970s in this country. Um, the All-African People's Revolutionary Party uh, begins sometime in the late 1970s, early 1980s. My organization, the al kebla Revivalist Movement, and many other Black, or the Black Unity and Freedom Parties in existence and other Black um, organizations and Pan-African organizations are developing uh, in this era. Yes. And what that culminates in is a thing called African Jubilee Year. And it is designed to coincide with three significant anniversaries. The first is the centenary of the most eminent Marcus Mazaya Garvey, i.e. the centenary since his birth. Marcus Garvey is born in 1887. And so 1987, the worldwide celebrations were taking place in relation to celebrating Marcus Mazaya Garvey as the most significant organizer of black people in the 20th century because of the size of uh, his organization and the magnitude of the achievement of the UNIA ACL. The second major anniversary was the 25th anniversary of uh, the Organization of African Unity, which was designed to forward a, decolon a, de a decolonizing and African unifying agenda uh, in the 1960s. And finally, the 150th anniversary since uh, the emancipation from uh, slavery in the Caribbean. And so um, emancipation... Um, the, o, the anniversary of the OAU, as well as Marcus Mazai Garvey, took place. All these anniversaries were taking place between the years of 1986 uh, and 1987. And so African Jubilee Year was constructed um, in that spirit to celebrate these anniversaries and put on programs and plans um, for projects um, in accordance with this declaration, which will be read earlier. But it is in this context that Ache Aba Adaye Sebo enters the UK in 1984. He's a teacher by trade. And so as he was teaching uh, in America, he began to teach here in the UK. And as a teacher in the UK, he has an interesting experience with one of his colleagues. And he uh, tells us uh, in a uh, interview with Baba, with Baba Kobira Zamani of uh, Nubiat, yeah, um, what the inspiration for Black History Month was. And he says, The inspiration for Black History Month came from an incident that happened at the GLC, that's the Greater London uh, Council, um, where I worked as the coordinator of special projects. A colleague of mine, a woman, came to work one morning looking very downcast and not herself. I asked her what the matter was, and she confided to me that the previous night when, her, when she was putting her son Marcus to bed, he asked her, Mum, why can't I be white? Pause. So we see from the very beginning that the inspiration again comes. Yeah, remember what we said about Carter G. Woodson earlier, the ver the, and, and Mama Mary McLeod Bethune, the, the, the very inception is this African child who lives in a world whereby his people are suffering from collective amnesia and has therefore in, in, in been embodied with self-hatred Yes, and inadequacies, a sense of inadequacy about himself. And so from the very inception, we can see that Baba Achiaba Adaya Seba is also concerned with reigniting the spark in the so-called Negro. Let's move on. So when this incident with Marcus took place in London, it dawned on me that something had to be done, had to happen here in Britain. I was familiar with Black History Month in America and thought that something like that had to be done here in the UK. Because if this was the fountainhead 
of colonialism, imperialism and racism. And despite all the institutions of higher learning and research, and also the cluster of African embassies, you could still find a six-year-old boy being confused about his identity, even though his mother had tried to correct it at birth. Let's address this. Baba Achiaba Adaya Sebo, obviously when he was in America, he learned about Black History Month, yeah? And one of the things that he was doing there was, um, he says in this, in the longer form of this, inter of this interview, that when he was teaching black children and he realized this, this the, the reality of these inadequacies of self, yeah? He began to use the Black History Month and other times of the year to teach about himself as an African, his people, the Ashanti. And he realized the positive impact, yeah, that this was having on the students that he was teaching. He began to teach them Ashanti names and about Ashanti ceremonies, and about Ashanti tradition and Adinka symbols and Kente and all these things. And he realized the sense of pride that it instilled in them, yeah? So he had tried and tested methods of the function of these things in, um, uh, the United States of uh, America. So he learns about Black History Month there and he comes here, he has this experience and he's saying, well, we can you, we can replicate this vibes, this energy, yes, um, over here and institute Black History Month in this country for the same purpose. But not only that, yes, not only that, remember, if this Britain was the fountainhead of colonialism, imperialism and racism, pause, what did Robin Walker teach us earlier? That the European denied the greatness of African history for the purpose of facilitating imperialism, racism, uh, and neocolonialism. And despite all the institutions of higher learning and research, and also the cluster of African embassies, you could still find a six-year-old boy being confused about his identity, even though his mother had tried to correct it at birth. What does that mean? The last part of that is referring to the fact that the, the mother named the child Marcus because she named him after Marcus Messiah Garvey. And so even with that inspiration, the indoctrination of the society had still confused this young African to the point whereby he didn't see worth in himself as an African and wanted to be white. So we see, first and foremost, yeah, that Black History Month was intended in this country to provide a remedy for that kind of occurrence happening, for, to provide a remedy for black children being induced with the seeds of self-hatred. But we also see that this could never be the product of a month-long celebration. So not even Black History Month in the UK was designed to be confined to the month of October. Okay? We know that. Yeah? We can see that based upon what Baba Achiaba Adaye Sebo is uh, saying here. He continues... Right. The, 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 uh, the aims and objectives yeah, of Black History Month in the UK were to promote positive public images and understanding, I should say, excuse me, of Africans and people of African descent and to encourage the positive teaching and development of their history, culture and struggle to support African organisations and liberation movements based in London. So we see here to promote positive public images and understanding of Africans and people of African descent. Very specific. We know all them are talking about. All right. And to encourage positive teaching and development of their history, culture and struggle. So we're not just talking about the past. We're talking about Wagwan right now, Yasso, and the problems that need to be solved for the future. This is, again, designed to give us a proper appreciation it's to restore the clock to restore the compass, yes? To enable us to restore our collective memory so we know how to function in our environment and also to support African organizations and liberation movements based in London, all right? The African Jubilee Year Declaration. So for this year, yeah, the African Jubilee Year, which was 18, 1987 to 1988, yeah, this declaration was drawn up. The African Jubilee Year Declaration is therefore a testament of London's solidarity with Africa and the international struggles against apartheid. 
By the designation of October as Black History Month, it is our expectation that Africa's ideals shall forever be manifested in the upliftment of the African personality in our schools, institutions of higher learning, communities, borough councils, and especially in the hearts and minds of politicians. So we see what the focus was. It was about supporting African liberation movements, not just teaching black history, not just saying, well, you know, Carter G. was the second African to achieve a PhD. Lewis Latimer invented the carbon filament for the light bulb. Um, uh, Garrett Morgan designed a telephone uh, and invented the gas mask. Um, Elijah McQuay invented the, the drip cup, um, you know, for uh, the, the, the lubrication of uh, machinery during the Industrial uh, Revolution. Uh, you know, not even just to say that, you know, there was an empire called Wagadu, Ghana, Mali and Songhai, that uh, open heart surgery was being done in uh, ancient Kemet, um, that the Ishanga bone can be found in the Congo and is, the first, is one of the oldest mathematical implements found ever in human history. And even older than that is the Labamba bone found uh, in Southern Africa. That wasn't, a, that, that's all that's good. Beautiful, but all of that serves the purpose of, and is put in the context of supporting liberation movements, yeah, and uplifting the African personality and all of these things. There's a, there's, there's a conscious purpose for teaching and developing a, an appreciation for this history. Some of the key names, yeah, um, that were involved, and this is just a few, there were so many more. Um, Herman Usley. Linda Bellos and Bernie Grant. Herman Usley and Linda Bellos are still on the scene, but Bernie Grant has passed away. But I use this particular picture because in 1986, him, um, uh, Sister Diane Abbott, um, uh, Paul Boateng and Keith Vaz, yeah, as the Asian, yeah, um, were elected to, uh, as MPs, yeah, to Parliament, as MPs, the first minority MPs uh, elected to parliament. So focusing, obviously this is black history, we're gonna focus on Bernie Grant, Diane Abbott and um, Paul Boateng. And the reality is that they are elected because after the so-called riots, yeah, more properly called uprisings, there's a report done called the Scarman Report. And the Scarman Report was uh, conducted, well, the result of an investigation conducted by Lord Scarman into the uprisings of black people in the UK. And so what he finds is that uh, these black people are experiencing a disassociation between themselves and society, disenfranchisement within the society. Um, and basically he puts forward certain measures to ensure that our sense of uh, isolation and discrimination and oppression doesn't become for them any more of a problem than it had become so far, all right? So he suggests two things. One is the creation uh, of a black uh, middle class, yes? What is the creation of a black middle class, yeah? And the second one is a ludibri. So we'll come back to that in, in, in a little bit later on, kings and queens. But as a result of that, um, politicians, yeah? To, to create a sense of inclusion, black politicians are elected to Parliament. And Bernie Grant on his first day in Parliament is dressed something like what you see in the picture right here in our Agbada. Agbada is, a, a, is the robe yeah, that you see him wearing, but it's a free piece um, garments yeah, from Nigeria. Caused consternation in British society because he was told that you must come to Parliament dressed properly. Yeah, um, but so I, just, I thought, thought that's a funny story, Kings and Queens, you know what I'm saying? Because, yeah, man, he distressed the war in the British society because he came in his traditional uh, African attire in 1986. Here you see um, an, an image on the left of uh, an African Jubilee year um, uh, uh, event. And on the right of the screen, you see a flyer, yeah, for Black History Month in 1987. And you can see there that the name, yeah, um, of the guest is Dr. Mawulana Karenga, who we mentioned earlier as related to the celebration and the development of Kwanzaa during the Black Power era. So these linkages between Black people across the diaspora are continuing to sustain themselves. But not only that, check the lineup, yeah, and this is not even an exhaustive list, 
But check the lineup of black people who came to the country, yeah, on the Black History Month bill of 1987. John Henry Clark, Yusuf Ben Yokanan, two of the greatest historians ever in the history of the world and certainly our Black African experience, came to this country for Black History Month. Sally Mugabe, the first wife of Robert Mugabe. Why? Because Zimbabwe had been uh, independent after a protracted liberation war in the 1970s. Zimbabwe gained its independence in 1980. For whatever reason, Baba Mugabe was unable to make it. And so his wife, Sally Mugabe, came in his stead. And uh, during that time, I remember very vividly, there were t-shirts going around the place that said, Azania today, sorry, Zimbabwe today, Azania, aka South Africa, tomorrow. And I've still got one of those t-shirts somewhere as well, kings and queens, yeah? But the idea was that um, because people were galvanizing around the anti-apartheid agenda, Zimbabwe was, was a finished project. Zimbabwe today, Azania, South Africa, um, tomorrow. And so in the spirit of connecting with liberation movements, the people that were heading those liberation movements all around the world were being invited to come to uh, the UK for Black History Month. Nina Simone, as you've already mentioned, the High Priestess of Soul. Yeah, I love this particular image of Nina Simone, you guys. It's, it says so much to me. It speaks to me. Grassa Machel, who was then the second wife of uh, Baba Samora Machel, who was very popular um, because of the, the liberation movement that was in progress in... Um, Mozambique, Mama Frances West Wilson, the author of the, the ISIS papers and the woman who crystallized our understanding of white supremacy, racism. Max Roach, who I mentioned before, and in fact, there is a park in Brixton named after Max Roach, Max Roach Park, named after this brilliant jazz drummer. Burning Spear. Yes, I, you know. No artist has sung more songs about Marcus Mazzai Garvey than Burning Spear. And next to him, you have the foremost educator, teacher, historian, and scholar on the life of legacy of the, and legacy of the most eminent prophet, Marcus Mazzai Garvey, and the UNIA ACL, Baba Tony Martin. So he was here, basically, as a part of the centenary. He yeah, came over to teach um, on his uh, outstanding work um, on documenting the legacy of our most prolific uh, organization of which we are a member today, kings and queens. And last but not least, and not even finally, because there was more, but Huma Sekela, yeah, again, connected with this anti-apartheid uh, energy, don't be fooled, you know, it was black people in this country that started and uh, formed the basis of the anti-apartheid movement in this country. Yeah, they will let you forget that. But it was the African, Pan-Africanist activists who fueled the fire in this country for the anti-apartheid movement uh, in the UK. And so H Baba Huma Sekela was brought here uh, in that spirit and in that energy also. All right, that's a bit of history. So now we're going to get into um, the, 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 forward, the, the, the present and forward thinking element of this particular presentation. And I hope you bear with me. We're going to look at now what does this, all of this stuff that our celebration of Black History Month say about our identity in this country uh, as black people, yeah? What is identity? 